What is going on guys and welcome to the Wednesday live stream. So I am actually down here at Piscine Energetics coming to talk to them about kind of fish food, fish nutrition, what do we actually need to feed our tank, waiting for Nuri who's kind of slacking over there, probably doing some actual work. But there's been one kind of thing where I kind of, oh, speaking of. Hey Devin, sorry, sorry I'm late guys. It's just been a uh, bit of a long, uh, long night fishing here, but I got my shrimp. And uh, safety first, you know. Sorry, guys, to take this life jacket off. That's all right. All right, Devin, good to see good you. you. Good to see you. Nuri. Sorry, I'm late. It's, uh, no problem. Fresh off the boat there. <laughs> all right. So, what is going on, guys? Welcome to the live stream. Hi, reef dudes, fans. All right. So, okay, today we want to talk about kind of fish nutrition and fish food. Like, what are we actually feeding our fish, right? Great question. What are we feeding our fish, Devin? Looking and forward to the discussion. It is. And actually, I want to start out because there's a lot of random information on labels. And how the heck do you read them? Like, what does all this mean? That's why a, do we care? What why do we care? Yeah. But Devin, that's a great question. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I really think that, uh, you know, one of the most confusing mm -hmm. issues around aquarium keeping and, and keeping fish yep. is about nutrition. Yep. You know, what's on a label? How do we interpret the label? And I think, you know, kind of from my experience, one of the things I've learned over, you know, being in, you know, the fish nutrition business for mm -hmm. a decade and a half in the aquarium industry yep. for two and a half decades or so, yep. um, you know, is really just kind of the lack of information that's out mm -hmm. there. And I think a lot of people are making decisions on the foods that they're putting in their aquariums based on opinion, not necessarily fact. Probably true. You know, it's one of those things, for example, I don't know, how many, how many live people do we have already? 24 and counting, okay, 40, 44, is, it's climbing. This is one of the favorite things I love to do right. uh, when speaking to aquarium hobbyists. Okay. Okay? So we're gonna have a little trivia to set, set the precedent for this afternoon's discussion. All right, what do you All right? Let's do this. So Devin, if I am new to the hobby, I'm coming in here, or mm -hmm. if I am an advanced hobbyist, and I have a reef tank, yep. Devin, where should my pH sit? Oh, 7.9 to 8.3, roughly. 7.9 to 8.3, okay. Yep. Happy zone. And what does a low pH mean? Uh, it's harder for your corals to calcify, and harder for your tank to kind of grow and thrive. Okay, and what yep. does a high pH mean? Generally, easier for corals to grow and encrust and you know, have more of a happy, thriving tank. Okay, so I'm assuming most yeah. of the people here, if we were to ask that question, mm -hmm. they would get that right. Probably, yeah. Okay, so I have a little nutrition question for the people here listening. And I'm gonna put a time limit on here. We're gonna go about 10 seconds. So everyone's gotta pop this up really fast. So my question is for everyone tuning in, and the winner is going to get, we need to have a prize. Um, what do you got? Oh, let's, let's grab some PE pellets right there, Devin. You see, how about the marine ones on the, oh, make me move. In the cabinet there? Perfect. Okay. All right. So we're all live, and this is your opportunity to win a pack of PE Mysis 2 millimeter pellets. So my question is, and it's gonna be 10 seconds. Can anybody tell me how many calories are in a gram of lipid? 10, nine, eight, seven, six. Question is, how many calories are in one gram of lipid? Or how many calories are in one gram of fat? We've got 25C, 175, 1, 2,000, 66, 200, okay. all over the map. Can anybody... Rito Reefer! Nine? You are the winner. You are the winner. Um, just curious, did you Google that? Or Siri that? I had no idea, so good on you guys. Okay, excellent. Does anybody know how many calories are in a gram of protein. 10, <laughs> 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. The question again is how many calories are in a gram of protein? 
Dun, dun, dun. Seven Jessica, you have won. You have won. Nice. And last but not least, can anybody tell me how many calories are in a gram of carbohydrates? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. No prize for that. So, for the record, who got the uh, lipids? Uh, that was Re Rita Reefer or something like that, and Jessica J. So Jessica J got the uh, protein. Yeah, and Rita Reefer got. And the first one. Rita Reefer got lipids. the lipids, which is nine yeah. grams per calorie. So we're gonna get you uh, uh, some PE pellets sent out for you guys. Awesome. Congrats. So I got another question for for, for the uh, the crew here. Can anybody tell me how many calories? Are in a gram of moisture or water? Does water have any calories? I would say zero. Devin, you win yes. a free coffee that we just made in our <laughs> lunchroom. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, does anybody know how many calories are in a gram of ash? I'm gonna guess nothing. Devin with the with the I'm double roll. hitter. You're a double nice. roll. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times when we talk about fish nutrition, mm -hmm. we really got to talk about calories. Yeah. And what does a fish need? Calories. Calories, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, it's, you know, if we were to just break this down, Devin, you go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. You buy a bag of groceries. Yep. And you come home with a bag of groceries. Yep. You have a full, full bag of groceries, Devin. And yes. it's from Whole Foods. High quality groceries, right? Whole Foods, we know it's we'll high, it. high quality, right? Mm -hmm. Can you survive on that bag of groceries? Probably, yeah. Yeah? Probably survive on anything, doesn't mean it's good for you. <laughs> what if I told you there actually wasn't any groceries in that bag and it was actually um, a dishcloth? Does that count as groceries though? That's like household items. Let's say it was water. Yeah. Would you survive on that? For a little right? while. You got no calories from water. Yep. So you would starve. Eventually, yep. What I'm basically the point I'm trying to make, and I'm just having on the spot here, <laughs> is yep. really, you know, it's about calories, right? So, do you know how many calories, give or take, a human being should eat? 2,000, 3,000. Two to 3,000. Yep. Does anybody know how many calories your fish should eat on a daily basis? Not a clue. Not a clue. How many? Well, it depends on the size of the fish. All depends on the size of the fish, right? Yeah. But we want to keep this really, really basic here. Yeah. Okay? So, you know, what a lot of people, you know, fail to recognize is that fish... Sorry, is there any questions? Give your test between the tank and the stand. Thanks for the 199 Super Chat, Jason. Ash is a mineral. <laughs> Zero. What is that? Is interesting. What is the 199? <laughs> Fill me in on that. <laughs> Super chat. Cheers. Thank you. All right. That's probably a good thing. I'm yeah. catching up here. <laughs> Super duper. All right, guys. So, anyway, let's talk about fish food. Okay. Let's get what, what I'm really trying to get down to. All right. To. So, right? okay. Calorie wise, no, that's a good thing. Obviously, it depends on the size of the creature, but like a small fish or like a big tang, like roughly, what do they need for calories in a day? So, the, the need for the calories in the mm -hmm. day from the fish is going to be completely different species to species. Yeah. Even if you have the same species, mm -hmm. it can vary due to the size of the tank, yep. due to the flow of the tank. More flow, more energy swimming, more food. Makes sense? There Not you go. Not something consider, but it makes sense. So this is a whole thing to look at, you know, yeah. the flow you have. If you have a tank that has very minimal flow, yeah. or if you have a tank, huh. that has a lot of flow, yeah. right? It's going on the treadmill. If you go on the treadmill and you set it for 12, uh, miles an hour mm -hmm. or three miles an hour, you're gonna burn a different amount of calories. That makes perfect sense. Not that I wouldn't have considered that, but it makes okay. perfect sense. So, you know, and and that's one thing. We, it's very difficult to have a discussion, you know, mm -hmm. to the broader spectrum of of uh, reef hobbyists yeah. and keepers because we're talking about all different size of aquariums, all different mm -hmm. size of fish, same yeah. species, all these different variables. When we really get into fish nutrition, mm -hmm. right? It's what I really want to talk about, you know, not necessarily what's in a food, mm -hmm. but what's 
not in the food. You know, okay. not what we want to give the yeah. fish, but what do we not want to give the fish? Fair enough. Right? Yep. So, for instance, mm -hmm. let's say you have a container of any fish food, yep. right? You can derive calories okay. from three things. Protein, lipids, carbs. Yep. Okay? What's also <laughs> in, in, in fish food you'll typically see mm -hmm. is moisture. Yep. And then you'll also see ash or okay. inorganics. Okay. okay. And so, you know, one of the trade-offs about prepared foods, let's say, you know, um, dry food mm -hmm. versus fresh foods or frozen foods, yep. is that typical manufacturing, they're going to denature or what's referred to as, you know, you're going to have uh, organic material become inorganic okay. due to the heat process, right? So that's taking something like your frozen food and turning into a pellet or flakes and stuff like that. Right. From drying it out to make it in that from, form. Yeah, tra okay. traditional, you know, pellet manufacturing. Yep. Okay. So, you know, in terms of, there's always questions about ash. Uh, <laughs> way too much eye contact. Okay. Sorry, Glenn. We'll uh, look at the camera. We just have a bit of a bromance going on. So, what we're basically talking about here is, you know, calories, mm -hmm. carbohydrates, protein, lipids, okay? What goes into a pack of fish food? You know, the only nutrition you can get really is, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. everyone remember this? Lipids, yeah. carbs, protein. There's no nutritional benefit that comes from moisture, mm -hmm. and there's no nutritional benefit that's in ash. Okay, so I want to throw a question out there. For I wish we had a poll set up. Yeah, not that fancy right now. Okay, what do you got? But <laughs> if you had the choice, yeah, that there was a pellet mm -hmm. that was coming from whole fish meal, okay, or deboned fish meal, what would you want? What would the market want? Well, I'd assume deboned because. Don't seem Devin, really Devin, we are, you're, you're, Devin's, he's, I'm leading the witness here. He knew this. <laughs> I, I mean, my dog likes chewing on bones, but I don't think he has much nutrition out of it. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right, Devin, right? Okay. So a lot of times, for instance, you know, when we look at uh, bone, deboned mm -hmm. fish meal um, versus whole fish meal, yeah. the reason a lot of companies like to put whole fish meal in there. Cheaper. You got it, Devin. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper. It's like you go to the fish market and you say, hey, I want tuna. Mm -hmm. And they go, do you want a whole tuna or do you want the filet? Yeah. I want the filet. Oh, interesting. The filet is more money. Not paying for all that bone weight and everything On else. a per pound basis, yeah. right? Makes sense. So when we talk about dry fish food, the way typical fish food is manufactured is you go out to a fishery. Let's say mm -hmm. it's herring. They have zillions and zillions of pounds of herring that come in. Mm -hmm. In the herring uh, industry, for example, here on the West Coast, they strip it for the roe. Mm -hmm. The roe is a value for the sushi trade. Yep. And once the females are stripped for the roe, it's basically just a cost recovery. Okay. Turn it into fish meal, press it of its oil, so on and so forth. Okay? Yep. So through that process, traditional fish meal, mm -hmm. it's dried at a very high temperature. Okay. So the reason they dry it at a high temperature is that time is money. And so they have another sleeping. huge packing boat coming in with mm -hmm. more herring. Okay. <laughs> but you've dried it. But mm -hmm. during that process, we have denatured the fish meal. Mm -hmm. And this is typically how fish pellets are made throughout the world. Okay. And what we also have to remember is 99% of fish food mm -hmm. or pellet food that is made around the world I shouldn't say fish food, pelletized food is made around the world that goes to feed fish, yep. are being fed to fish being aquacultured. Okay. And an aquacultured fish, the companies behind that, their performance indicator is how big and fat can I grow this fish as quickly as possible. Makes sense. And so where Piscine differentiates ourselves is mm -hmm. we're not in the fish growth business. We are in the fish health business. And that's how we really develop, you know, our methodology behind mm -hmm. taking our yeah. mice shrimp and mm -hmm. incorporating it in, into a pellet or flake food as the leading ingredient because mm -hmm. we don't first pre-dry yeah. the mice shrimp. That makes sense.
Okay, wait, wait. You say don't pre-dry it, but there's also pellets which come dry mysis. So right. <laughs> so excellent question, Devin. Yep. So how we made yep. our pellets mm -hmm. is we take fresh mysis, yeah, as which is the lead ingredient. There's yeah. other dry ingredients that we mix it to. So we do mm -hmm. have deboned fish meal, for example, in here. We put some spirulina in uh, in our pellets and some other ingredients as well. Okay. But the main ingredient, which is our mysis shrimp, mm -hmm. we haven't first pre-dried it, okay. nor have we pressed it of its oils. So it all stays in it when you're mixing it. It stays in it when we're mixing it, exactly. Okay. And because we've done it in that uh, methodology, mm -hmm. and then we do a very slow drying process on the back end, we dry at a temperature which we are not denaturing the mysis shrimp which goes into the pellet. So you dry it at a cooler temperature? Much, much cooler temperature. Burns away less stuff, basically. Right. Okay. Not denaturing it. Denaturing. Denaturating. Denaturing. <laughs> Denature. Denaturing. Right? Yeah. So what that ultimately means mm -hmm. is that we're getting all the benefits from the mysis shrimp into a convenient pellet food for those who want to feed a pellet or a dry okay. diet. Makes sense. Okay, question now. Mm -hmm. Is so is ash like a byproduct of doing the high heat, everything else? Like is that just the stuff that's burnt off and not just nutrition anymore? Is that what ash is? Correct. Okay. So uh, ash is uh, 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 derived from a thermal process. Okay. okay? Yeah. So uh, you're not a vegetarian, are you, Devin? No. Okay, so you're you're, you're a meat eater. <laughs> I like my sushi and my meat. <laughs> sushi is meat. Okay. So if yep. you're going to get a steak, yep. How do you normally cook your steak? Medium rare. Medium rare. Yeah. If you were to leave your steak on your barbecue mm -hmm. and crank that temperature up to 500 degrees. A waste of a good steak. And you left it on the barbecue for an hour. Yeah. What is your steak going to look like? A tiny chunk of charcoal. Is there going to be any protein left in that steak? Probably not, actually. Just be all carbon. Is there any, is there any <laughs> lipid left in that steak? Probably not. It's a waste of a good steak. And it turns to ash. Okay. That's, okay? Yep. So there is a term about denaturing, aren't there basic amino acids still provided to nutrient to fish? Great question. So, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Jessica. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. So, there's a terminology, so it's called the bioenergetics of fish nutrition. Mm -hmm. And what this refers to is how a fish is going to digest the food. Okay. Okay? So, the very first thing a fish spends energy on is removing the non-digestible food, mm -hmm. so the inorganics. Okay. So what this means is, let's say you feed your aquarium um, a pound of fish food. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to use it, normally we do a lot with public yeah, aquariums. you guys do mainly so, public aquariums. So okay, let, yeah. let, let's say you feed, doesn't matter, let's say okay. you feed your aquarium a pound of fish food during X amount of time. Mm -hmm. And that, fish food that you're feeding has a moisture content of, let's say, I'll use a, an extreme example. Let's say there's a semi-moist pellet out there. Let's say it has okay. a moisture content of 20%. Yeah. And when you look at the label, and when you look at the label, the label has a ash content of, say, 12% or 15%. Mm -hmm. So we already discussed earlier, there's no nutrients in moisture. Yep. But they you, do live in water. You do live in water. <laughs> but there's no nutrients from moisture or water. Yeah. But what's in there mm -hmm. is when you look at a package to determine the amount of ash on dry matter mm -hmm. or to determine the amount of lipid on dry matter or protein on dry matter or carbs on dry matter, yep. you remove the moisture and let's say you had 15% um, ash. But it's not 15% of 100 now. That's including the moisture. So the moisture doesn't even count. So, so you go 15% over 80. 80 units and actually so it's boosts actually higher, huh? that ash even higher. Sneaky. Okay. So you feed a fish a pound of food. Mm -hmm. And let's say 20% of that's moisture. Okay, so that's gone. But then you're feeding it X amount of ash or inorganics. So it's 15% okay? of the 80%. So it's yeah. actually more than 15%. Sneaky labeling. It's not sneaky labeling, it's yeah, just it people don't talk about this, but we like bringing, yeah. we, we want our customers mm -hmm. to be informed, we want the market to be informed, mm -hmm. and make informed, fact-based decisions, yeah. right? 
So what does a fish need to do? It doesn't just remove those inorganics out of its body. Mm -hmm. It has to now spend calories so. to remove the inorganics out of the body. Mm -hmm. So what is it doing? Wasting it's calories. using the protein, mm -hmm. the lipids, and the carbs to get rid of the ash. To get rid of the ash. <laughs> Counterproductive a little bit, eh? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So not all fish are finicky. So this is a, this is a great, yeah. uh, I, I hear this line all the time. Mm -hmm. Hobbyist goes, you know, my fish aren't finicky. They eat anything. I'm just going to feed it a cheap product, so to speak. Yeah. So what is cheap? A cheap product is really relative to typically a product that has very few calories in a container. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when you fish, when you feed a fish, mm -hmm. a product that has a low amount of calories, mm -hmm. I mean, in a size of a container yeah. versus a product that comes in the same size container that has a higher amount of calories, mm -hmm. if you feed that fish a teaspoon of a lower caloric diet, yeah. it's going to need to eat more. Makes sense. So what did people do? Oh, my fish aren't putting on weight. I probably should feed them more. Mm -hmm. So they put food in the tank. Fish gobbles it up. They're still hungry. They put more food in that tank. Fish gobbles it up. Fish aren't getting overweight. They're not getting obese. They're still hungry. And they keep feeding the, fi feeding the aquarium, feeding the aquarium, feeding the aquarium. Mm -hmm. And what do fish do? Where do fish go to the toilet? In the tank. Fish are the only animals that go to the toilet right in their living room. That's a fair point. <laughs> so they're, now you're compromising the water quality yep. of the aquarium because mm -hmm. of the food choices that you're making to feed the fish. Yeah, makes right? sense. So, you know, we can, uh, there's a cool, I know we talked about this, uh, and there's a kind of a diagram. Yeah. It might be, uh, you know, I'm a pretty visual learner as well. It might just be beneficial uh, just for the folks here just to see what we're kind of talking about. Yeah, so what we basically have here is, um, here's PE pellets on the left, and there's a couple other uh, products that are on the market. And uh, I like to use the traffic sign signal. And so green, we say, is potentially good. Orange is slow down caution. In this case, orange represents moisture. It's not doing any harm. It's only, but it's not doing any benefit either. Just filler. It's just, you're paying for it. Product filler. You know, mm -hmm. if you're concerned about the environment and you're buying fish food, you know, and you're buying fish food that has a moisture content of 10% or even 20%, um, it's really just more material that's going into the landfill. And the red there represents ash. Mm -hmm. So the red is non-digestible. Okay. There's no calories in the red. Mm -hmm. So basically what happens there is that is then what is requiring your fish to now have to feed and eat even more food. So one of the unique things about the methodology, how we created and make PE pellets, mm -hmm. is regardless of our moisture content, mm -hmm. our ash basically stays the same. Okay. So it's not this direct yeah. correlation because most pellets, how they're made is, they're denaturing it through the cooking and the drying process, mm -hmm. where our product, our net grams of inorganics, mm -hmm. doesn't change from our raw materials till our finished product. Okay. So what that basically means in a, say in a bucket of, I like to use a bucket, in a bucket of PE pellets, you know, you have this much that makes up moisture and mm -hmm. ash. But you have 92%, which is mm -hmm. potentially, and I say potentially, available digestible nutrition. Okay. Okay. Now I have another question for you. So Please. I know there's two groups of people. You know, one people are hardcore on the pellets, and other people are hardcore on the frozen. Mm -hmm. And I saw a couple questions earlier. They're asking about, you know, if you're rinsing frozen versus not. I've personally never bothered rinsing it because mm -hmm. to me, you're just giving away good yeah. little coral foods in there. But is there any big difference nutrition-wise from pellets to frozen? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So first um, is, are you talking about frozen in general or do you want me to speak specifically well, on, you know, you know, on our mysis? Yeah, mysis. Okay, sure. Because the pellets are made from mysis, right? Yeah. Or you got mysis. 
-hmm. Now, is there a big difference if I say, like I mix it up, but if I say sure. just feed one or the other? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, what it really comes down to is, you know, looking at a package and looking at the protein and the lipids, mm -hmm. it can be extremely misleading. Okay. Okay. So, um, one of the things you really want to look into is the lipid profile, mm -hmm. and it's the amino acid profile. Okay. And I don't want to go into the whole, uh, down a rabbit hole and get too detailed here. High, okay. high, high level. level. High level. So what, what, yeah. what we can basically tell is one of the benefits of our PE mm -hmm. pellets yep. is that we get the lipids from our PE mysis. Yep. And our lipids are not being denatured. Okay. So what's really interesting is we've actually done li uh, lipid analysis mm -hmm. from, so basically we make the pellet, yeah. then we do an analysis on the lipids that's in the pellet, mm -hmm. and then we have the analysis on our fresh mysis, mm -hmm. and the lipid profile has not changed Really? At it's all. actually the same? Yes. Interesting. And that is really, really unique hmm. because it hasn't been denatured. And at the same time, there's a lot right. of... So if I feed a cube of mysis or like a thing of pellets, they're getting the same amount of lipids out of it. Okay, so g great question. <laughs> so the lipid profile. Okay. Okay. So the amount of lipids, mm -hmm. right, that's in the mysis shrimp, right? Yeah. Versus the amount of lipids mm -hmm. that is in the dry product. Yeah. Okay? So there's actually overall more lipids mm -hmm. in, a fro in the frozen product than okay. the dry product. Okay. Now, is it a big difference, little difference? Um, this is a great question. Devin. Well, it's because I see some, some people like hardcore, I only feed yeah. pellets, some I only feed mysis, yeah. or frozen. Like, that's what I'm just kind of see. Like, is there that much of a difference at the end of the day, or are they both, you know, pretty darn close? Okay. Okay. So, on... Okay, this is what I can tell you, okay? okay so wait. the density, okay. all right, I'll tell you the okay. density. So in a one kilogram mm -hmm. of pellets, yep. PE pellets, there's about 4,200 calories. Okay. Okay? In one kilogram of frozen mysis, mm -hmm. there's about anywhere between 1,200 and say 1,600 calories, okay? Okay. okay? So this is more caloric Cal dense yeah. because there's no moisture in it. Okay, I guess that okay. makes sense. Okay. So if you were to feed mm -hmm. a pound of frozen mysis yeah. or a pound of PE pellets, yeah. there's going to be more calories in a pound of the dry product because okay. it's denser. There's 2-3% yeah. moisture in our pellets versus yeah, say 70% moisture in a frozen diet. Yeah, it's okay? right the water, fresh frozen. Right. So is that... Which is actually another kind of cool sidebar. Yeah. That you guys actually troll it out of the lake and flash freeze it so they're basically as close as you can be to live before they're frozen. They are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, that's a great point. So, mm -hmm. you know, another thing... Whoops. Did I just pull this? No, I think we're still good. There you go. um, so another thing about that as well is we mm -hmm. harvest the shrimp at nighttime. Yeah. Okay. So... For those of you watching in and tuning in who aren't familiar with PE mysis and the story behind it, so it's actually considered an invasive species in the lake where we harvest it from. So uh, we harvest a shrimp in a lake in British Columbia, Canada. And oh, that's a great, uh, great image there, Devin, to, to share. Um, we harvest the shrimp in a lake in British Columbia, Canada. It's called the Okanagan Lake. And this lake is about 150 kilometers north-south, about 90 miles. Okay. And the widest point of the lake is only about a mile and a half, yeah. maybe two and a half K. And it's extremely deep. The average depth mm -hmm. of the lake is up to 500 feet deep. And back in the 60s, the British Columbia Ministry of Environment, they introduced mysa shrimp to Okanagan Lake because it was supposed to be a food source for, uh, we have a landlocked, in essence, a landlocked sockeye salmon. We call yep. it kokanee salmon. Mm -hmm. And they introduced the mysis shrimp to help uh, provide forage or a food source for mm -hmm. the kokanee salmon. Yep. And they did this to a number of lakes in British Columbia back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. 
And it was highly successful in some of these alpine, shallow lakes that, you know, were only 100 feet deep, 150 feet deep, 60 feet ah, deep. That's why it went so, okay. So they set the precedent in introducing mm -hmm. the shrimp to these lakes, which were rather shallow. Mm -hmm. They thought, hey, this is great. So they then put some mice and shrimp into Okanagan Lake, mm -hmm. but they failed to recognize, the Ministry of Environment failed to recognize <laughs> that the average depth of the lake is 400, 500 feet deep. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some deepest spots uh, on the lake that are up to 700 feet deep. That's crazy. Yeah. And so what the mice and shrimp learned to do is during the day, they're going to go right down to the bottom of the lake. Mm -hmm. And at nighttime, they would come up and they'd feed on the phytoplankton and zooplankton mm -hmm. during the night. Yeah. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with the region uh, in British Columbia where we are, uh, it's about 400 kilometers, about 250 miles east of Vancouver. So we're mm -hmm. right in the middle of the province and we're only about... Uh, 60 miles really north of the US Canada border. Mm -hmm. So we're actually in what's called Canada's only pocket desert. And in the summertime, it gets mm -hmm. extremely hot. So, mm -hmm. you know, just like the, our friends and folks down in California and Oregon have forest mm -hmm. fire issues, we do have that too as well problem right here in the interior of BC because mm -hmm. it is a dry pocket desert. But what that means is this lake has a very, very unique uh, environment or creates the, the 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 pocket desert creates a unique environment in the lake. Mm. What I mean by that is in the summertime, the surface temperature of the water it's well into the 70s. Yeah, it's toasty. It's nice. Jump right in. Everyone's most of the boats on the yeah. lake are <laughs> ski boats, and uh, we've our wakeboarding and sailing, and then we got the the Piscine, uh, shrimp trawlers, <laughs> <laughs> fishing boats in the night. And um, but you go 30, 40 feet below the surface, and it is freezing cold water. Mm -hmm. It's 48 degrees. And so what that did, it creates this massive amount of phytoplankton on the surface. And is that, is that uh, image still up there, Devin? I can't remember. I'll pull back up. Uh, just shows the food web, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you see, the natural kind of food web as it went in the lake was, you know, we had our basic phytoplankton or algae, which is consumed by different zooplankton. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is then traditionally consumed by these kokanee salmon. And then the biggest fish in the lake are rainbow trout. And when the ministry introduced the mice as shrimp, they thought it's gonna be great. The kokanee salmon are gonna eat them. But the mice as shrimp ended up multiplying like crazy and is the biggest biomass in the lake and was consuming all that phytoplankton, all that zooplankton, mm -hmm. and in essence, starving the kokanee yeah. salmon. So, so they try to feed them and end up starving them. It's pretty yeah. crazy. So we actually are, you know, when uh, when people say, hey, what, our staff, for instance, yeah. in China, they go, hey, what do you do? And so it's, oh, I work mm -hmm. for Pisces Energetics. People say, well, what is that company? You know, most of the market look at us as we are a fish food manufacturer. Yeah. We're actually <laughs> an environmental restoration company. Mm -hmm. We are helping to rehabilitate kokanee salmon in freshwater lakes in British Columbia through the removal of these mice of shrimp. And we d developed a whole you know, bunch of patents on our technology, how mm -hmm. we remove the mice and mitigate the bycatch of the kokanee salmon fry. Mm -hmm. And if any, some folks have seen our videos, it's it kind shows. of ironic that you're, they introduce food and it ended up being counterproductive and like taking away a food source. And now you're, so you're removing this in, invasive food source that we now feed our fish. Yeah. Crazy. So, so <laughs> it, it's really like, um, you know, it's uh, people say it's a sustainable mm -hmm. source. I say it's you no know, sustainability cubed. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're removing an invasive species. Yeah. We're rehabilitating a salmon population. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our sort of claim to fame, you know, what, what, what kind of put us on the map it's going back 15 years ago was with mm -hmm. seahorse breeders, right? Yeah. At the time, you know, really critically endangered species. So here we are removing shrimp, saving an endangered species yeah. in the lake, mm -hmm. and then supplying the market with food to breed, you know, all, the other endangered species. all these other endangered okay. species. This actually brings on a good little sidebar here. So sure. a lot of your stuff, well, with public aquariums and stuff is around sustainability mm -hmm. and breeding and all these different projects, which is a lot of what your food goes towards. 
like huge chunk towards that side of it versus the like aquarium side. I know it's both, but so one cool program that you guys got going on is like the Save Your Aquarium right now. Yes. Yes. All right. So how how did this start? Okay. Okay. So um, yeah. So for those of you who haven't heard about this mm -hmm. program, this is something that every hobbyist uh, can get behind, or and you don't even need to be a hobbyist to get behind mm -hmm. this. Um, so basically, how it came about was mm -hmm. um, the Save Your Aquarium campaign was really an initiative, I call it, a, uh, uh, an eye-opener, which was really born out of the COVID-19 pandemic, yeah. right? Um, you know, this whole last six months has really been humbling for myself personally, mm -hmm. for our company, for Piscean yeah. Energetics. Um, and this all really came out of COVID. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I'll share with you a little, little story how this really right. kind of Sure uh, <laughs> happen. And, uh, yeah. and I'm going to challenge all you aquarium hobbyists to uh, step up to the plate and join me in the Save Your mm -hmm. Aquarium campaign. So back in uh, March, um, March 15th, I believe, my kids were on spring break mm -hmm. and my wife and I decided we're going to take them to Las Vegas. <laughs> I never nice. thought I was going to take my kids to Las Vegas. How old are your but kids? I thought, uh, probably shouldn't say on camera, <laughs> uh, nine, seven, and five. Yep. I thought, you know, we're going to go to Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and we're going to do all the family things. Mm -hmm. um, I've never done in all my many trips to Vegas. Yep. But I thought, you know, we're going to do, uh, you know, go Grand Canyon, go mm -hmm. to Red Rock, you know, do some hiking, just, you know, a lot of cool stuff, you know, Hoover Dam, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I was in Las Vegas. You know, we have a lot of uh, industry uh, friends and colleagues. There's a lot of, you know, public facilities that we do business with down there. And you know, whenever I'm down there, I like to get together with them. And so mm -hmm. I was out for a dinner for with about a dozen of the different public aquarium uh, professionals down there. Mm -hmm. And I've never been in a dinner with the tone of the table, Devin, in yeah. being in this industry for 15 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I was sitting at dinner saying, "Hey, how is everything going?" And literally, phones are going off at the around the table saying, uh, "Our casino is closing tomorrow." Really? Our Aquarium is closing tomorrow. Um, there's people exactly. sitting around saying, you know what? Oh, my job's safe. And guess what? The next morning they didn't have a job. Yikes. And so, you know, I basically had to cut my trip short. I came mm -hmm. home uh, early with my family. And all of a sudden, worldwide, we saw for the first time ever, mm -hmm. hundreds of zoological institutions and public aquariums closing their doors because of COVID-19 many of them closing their doors for the first time ever. Yeah, that's crazy. So when you actually stop and think about it, mm -hmm. zoos and public aquariums are one of those few places that stay open Always. New Year's Day, mm -hmm. Christmas, Thanksgiving. Public aquariums and zoos stay Real open close. and they cater to families, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, I basically was, came back to, uh, uh, to Canada and we start dealing with all our own, you know, COVID uh, preparation, mm -hmm. you know, putting all the safety measures, spatial distancing at uh, the office, personal protection equipment, all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, starting to get calls from all our public aquariums and zoos. Mm -hmm. um, just seeing how they're going. And, you know, this was not yeah. the typical world <laughs> mm -hmm. we, were, we, were, we were working in, right? Yeah. Um, and virtually you had public aquariums going from normal operation to zero revenue. Now, you can't just furlough a fish. Mm. You can't just lay off, <laughs> lay off your the fish. animals and yeah. say, sorry, right? Mm -hmm. They had to keep feeding them. Mm -hmm. They had to keep caring for them. Um, and so one of the things we did, we actually launched a, uh, a series of webinars and kind of created a virtual um, conference for uh, the zoo and the aquarium industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through that, a topic that kept coming up was this financial crisis. How are we going to combat yeah. that, right? Well, I'm, one would assume people attending aquariums and stuff is kind of the main income, right? So Absolutely. No, they one's went, been, no one's going anywhere. So, and then, yeah. They went from normal operation to nothing, zero revenue, mm -hmm. right? You know, and I thought, you know, here we are. Um, 
as a, as a company, mm -hmm. you know, what I believe is, you know, we are a trendsetter in terms of environmental and corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a firm believer that we had to step up to the plate. So what we basically did is we created a campaign, mm -hmm. which is called Save Your Aquarium, and you can go to saveyouraquarium.com. Okay. And what we basically did is we decided that, I know some of the hobbyists may have seen these, these are more of our bulk Jumbo uh, size. pellets. Mm -hmm. This is a five pound bucket of pellets. And we have aquariums who you know, are feeding these, this quantity daily to exhibits. Oh. And we created a, a, a campaign that if you are an aquarium hobbyist at home mm -hmm. and you purchase one of these buckets, yep. you can now select the aquarium mm -hmm. that inspired you to get into the hobby once yeah. upon a time. And you can now donate and we are going to match that purchase. So some buys one, so you donate buy a bucket. A bucket we're also yeah. going to give a bucket to the public aquarium of nice. your choice. And you know what's really interesting is when we start to go through this, and for those who have an aquarium at home, you know everyone who's watching right now, I want you to stop for a second. I really want you to think, you know, when was the first time you saw a clownfish? When was the first time you decided mm -hmm. you're going to set up an aquarium in your home, right? I can tell you exactly for me, I was about five. I have three older brothers. We, already ha we always mm -hmm. had aquariums in the home. Yeah. And, um, but they would be empty. <laughs> they'd be full with water, then they'd be empty. They'd be full with water, they'd be empty. But I remember I was five mm -hmm. years old. I grew up in Vancouver, mm -hmm. British Columbia. I walked in there. And at the time, you know, walking around the, uh, the exhibit, I remember you walk right into the tropical gallery, you mm -hmm. hang right, you're in fresh water, you hang left, you're in salt water. Mm -hmm. And I knew salt water was out of the question at the time. I was only five years old and my parents were like, Fair. nope, salt water is not the time. Yeah. But I walked, took the right, opened the doors right into the Amazon gallery where it's, you know, 90 degrees. I walked in there and boom, I fell in love with this mm -hmm. Tiger Oscar. That's what sucked you in. And that's what got me into aquariums. Mm -hmm. So then I coerced my parents into allowing me to get an Oscar. Mm -hmm. I had a 15 gallon hexagonal aquarium. Yeah. So about two months later, I coerced them into getting me a 33 gallon. And then it was a 72 gallon mm -hmm. when I was a little kid. Sounds like right? a legit aquarist. And you know, and that was my inspiration, mm -hmm. right? And I really think as aquarium hobbyists, um, I challenge everyone, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, support their local zoo or aquarium. And it doesn't mm -hmm. need to be by a bucket. You can also give any nominal yeah. uh, 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 donate or nominal uh, dollar. Mm -hmm. and there's also a lot of uh, retail stores which are now actually partnering with us. That's cool. And you'll actually start seeing this um, flow right out mm -hmm. uh, into the market. But if you have a huge aquarium and yeah. you're looking for a caloric <laughs> dense product, <laughs> And if you want to help contribute to the mm -hmm. reduction of mysis shrimp, if saving salmon is on your initiative, um, that's the rubber arm I'm trying to twist right now. Nice. That's pretty <laughs> um, awesome, though. And if you don't care about the environment, you don't care about these initiatives, and I've said this publicly and I say it all the time, you should probably look at the hobby you're in. No, so it, it is pretty cool that you are doing that. So if, if I buy a bucket, then you'll I can pick any aquarium, and you're like, here you go, Merry Christmas. Yeah, absolutely. So oh, on the cool. SaveYourAquarium.com, that yep. has all the North American aquariums. Okay. And then it is SaveYourAquarium.com slash Europe. Yep. That brings up uh, all the aquariums in yep. Europe <laughs> that we're supporting. Mm -hmm. And then um, any other aquarium, uh, what, what you'll find on the Save Your Aquarium. Yep. Dot com. If there's international okay. people uh, watching, absolutely, like we have aquariums in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, international shipping. Okay, so where in the world does this count, Tom? So Save Your Aquarium campaign, yep. it, it, if you don't see uh, the aquarium that you're looking to support on our mm -hmm. website, please email us. Okay. And we will tell you how we can coordinate that and nice. facilitate that. Awesome. Yep. Okay, so mainly, so Canada, US, Europe? Europe, yeah. Okay. Awesome. It's so the most uh, good chunk of the world. Part right now, yeah. yeah. Anything else that'll mm -hmm. be under, you'll see some uh, various countries under the normal yep. uh, website.
Okay, perfect. So international shipping, if someone wants to order them, all those three countries, fair game? Yeah, okay. just let perfect. us know. Okay, awesome, there you go. Saveyourquarium.com? Yeah. Saveyourquarium.com. Okay, perfect. Um, now, if you guys have any... <laughs> if you guys have any other specific Siri questions around pricing energetics or the food, frozen pellets, flakes, anything, let me know. But that is pretty awesome. I really think that's cool that you guys are doing that to help them out. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to challenge all the aquarium yep. hobbyists who are fans of Reef Dudes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, it's pretty cool. Um, so now with all the public aquariums, like they're all, I'm assuming most of them are probably all still closed. I don't have anything starting to no, open so up slowly. Uh, you know, some have, Devin. Yep. Uh, some aquariums have opened up. Mm -hmm. uh, those that have, mm -hmm. um, because they have be to, crew, though, exactly. trying to get by right now. And they also have to limit the amount of visitors that they mm -hmm. have. You know, so I was, uh, last week was actually the uh, AZA conference, Association of mm -hmm. Zoos Aquarium. It was all virtual this year. Yep. You know, but just speaking to some of the, uh, uh, the facilities down there, Mm -hmm. They've opened, but they have one third the amount of visitors that are coming through. Yeah, well, that's all the revenue, right? So. Right, and so you know, it's just it's a challenge, right? Some yeah. aquariums have opened and had to close back down, yeah. depending yeah, on the legislation currently in their state yeah, or that sort all of over thing. The place, so everywhere. Yeah, no, definitely, mm -hmm. it's a challenge. It's a yeah. challenge for sure. Definitely. Well, no, I appreciate. It. I think that's really awesome what you guys are doing. So happy, happy to share it. And hopefully. Someone wants to stock up on some food and help save your local aquarium. Um, used to feed my own fish foods, so will my fish rush on your pellets? <laughs> you know, that is going to be the, uh, the try. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I have personally used them in my tank, and I know everything goes for it like crazy. And I actually ran out of frozen food, so I've been feeding pellets lately, and yeah, they still go nuts for it. Do you make an anti as high metabolism slash small gut food? So that's a, that is a great question, Aaron. So one of, uh, you know, w one of our Piscine kind of claims to fame is, yeah, finicky fish will go after them. And we actually had yeah. a, uh, a store mm -hmm. that was always using our mysis uh, to feed their anthias. Yeah. And they had, in their display tank, they feed mm -hmm. them pellets. Well, their anthias wouldn't touch anything. Yeah. But there's a pellet that comes in a foily blue package that they got their hands on, yep. threw it into their aquarium, and the amphias were uh, eating the pellet. Nice. Um, yeah, so, Aaron, I don't know if you were joining us right from the beginning, but we just sort of talked about, you know, the uh, uh, sort of like the bioenergetics of our food and the digestibility. So extremely easy mm -hmm. on the fish to digest. No. And that also really comes down to you know, when everyone's quarantining or acclimating new food, you know, fish have a maximum amount of energy that they can use. And that energy drain is really put on fish when they're in quarantining, when they're trying to fight off disease, if you're medicating and all of a sudden they're trying to deal with an environment with medication. The last thing fish want to do is spend time removing inorganics. Yeah, that makes sense. And what you talk about, it's kind of this negative net calorie. You mm -hmm. feed them this food and they got to spend so much energy to get rid of it. So all of a sudden to get rid of it yeah. and then to feed them more. No, that makes sense. Um, now the other part of that question, small gut specific. So these come in different sizes too, yep. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this says two That's a two mil, but there's a one, two, one mil, yeah, one, two, three millimeter uh, okay. pellets. Excellent. Um, what kind of food will contribute to the least amount of phosphates? I'm assuming this is in your tank. Now, this, this one makes me laugh because I see so many posts now about people trying to add nutrients back to their tank. But <laughs> So is one less phosphates, pellets versus frozen versus flake? Is there any big difference? Is it all? Okay. This is, this is a great, great question. Perfect. So phosphate, mm -hmm. every, we all need phosphorus. Yes, we do. We need phosphorus. Yes. So, phosphorus is a good thing for animals. Yes. Zero now, if you're feeding a diet that is non-digestible, mm -hmm. bad phosphorus, <laughs> and non-absorbable, mm -hmm. and the fish are pooping out lots, mm -hmm. versus feeding a diet that is highly digestible and absorbable of the fish, or mm -hmm. to the fish, and they're pooping out less, 
and the net amount of food that has to go into the tank because it's high calorie versus low calorie, That's you're going that is what is yeah. gonna determine phosphate level. Yeah. It is the digestibility and the, and the bioavailability of the food. So by feeding more nutrient rich fish has been more absorbed not excess waste that's just flowing through and adding to phosphates. Yes. Okay. And so, you know, I've, I've read articles, uh, I've seen some people in the past have tried to test phosphates in the food. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you have someone who has a piece, of, a piece of food that they thaw out into a mm -hmm. cup of water and they test the water and go, oh my God, it's high in phosphate versus this one that's low in phosphate. Mm -hmm. um, there is no scientific hypothesis. <laughs> there's nothing, there's well, no validity behind that. Saturation. There's no validity behind it, okay. right? So, um, you know, rather than talking about the lack of phosphates, I always encourage, mm -hmm. um, there's t tons of great articles out there mm -hmm. that talk about why animals need phosphate. Yeah. Why? Oh, zero, zero is terrible for your tank. Like, zero's why bad. do fish yeah. need it? Why do humans need it? What mm -hmm. do we need it for? <laughs> You definitely do. Okay, here, here's a good one. Adam, I've only ever fed frozen food. Is there any compelling reasons I should also use pellets? Um, I, so, so being in the fish food business, mm -hmm. I was a little bit, um, let's say the right word, it's a very technical word, prejudice <laughs> to, to feeding <laughs> only frozen foods Fair. until, I, until uh, there was a pellet food. But no, I feed pellet foods. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what. I never fed frozen, I only fed frozen foods until I had kids. And then I was so busy in the morning, I didn't have that extra one minute, Devin, to thaw yeah. out the frozen food and no, put it into no my aquarium. No need to thaw. You put it right on the side of your power head and let it just yes, like, psh, 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 you're right. Your that's, what the that's, eco, what that's what I use my little Ecotech uh, uh, <laughs> thing for. Uh, but mm -hmm. look, no matter what, frozen has the highest digestibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. There okay. is there is any, and this is another thing I tell everyone. If you were to look at any frozen food that's out there, mm -hmm. like I'm talking about a frozen fish. Yeah. There's no frozen fish out there that has ash above two percent. Mm -hmm. So if any manufacturer says, "Oh, well, our ash levels because of all the vitamins and minerals and this, that, and the other," mm -hmm. um, I would have to say. Good. That's that's a marketing ploy. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's yeah. just call a spade a spade. <laughs> yep. All right. What else we got? Uh, really good questions. Fe feed seaweed in the morning, pellets three times a day on an auto feeder, and frozen at night. Best of all worlds. For, pellets are totally my lazy food. Where I'm just like, eh, throw some in the tank for running out and gotta do stuff. They're yeah. my qu my quick and easy feeding. Beauty. Um, a couple other ones are asking a Oil skimmer. Okay, why does my skimmer collapse every time I feed PE mysis? Oil in this shrimp. Could it be from the amino acids and stuff affecting it? Definitely, it's high lipid in the in the yeah. mysis simply because it's, uh, yeah, you know. Um, so your skimmer collapse. I turn my skimmer off and, okay, when I feed the tank, I turn off for, I think I do it for 45 minutes. Skimmer off, return pump off. That way all the food stays in the tank. It's not yeah. going to my filter, not going to my skimmer. It just circulates around until the fish and the corals, everything catch it. So that's, that's what so I do. I have, I have a great skimmer story that I love to share with hobbyists. All right, what do you got? So there was a, there was a, there was a public institution mm -hmm. that, we were, uh, uh, that we'd been supplying our frozen with for years. Okay. And they were looking to convert over to a different pellet. Mm -hmm. And when we launched our pellets, as one of the first public facilities that uh, brought our pellets on. Yeah. And they were feeding um, quite heavy on pellets to this mm -hmm. display. Two things that happened. One was when they fed the pellets, mm -hmm. they ended up having to cut the pellets from about four pounds a day down to mm -hmm. two pounds. It's a good chunk. They're feeding, f I'll repeat that, they're feeding four pounds mm -hmm. of a different pellet and then they fed two pounds of our pellet. Question. Yes. How, okay, then I'll tell your story first. No, no, please, please, no. No, 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 okay. So you said they, they cut down how? Yeah. How do they know that they need to start feeding less? Okay. Because one of the things we do is when a new institution comes mm -hmm. on board, a lot of the, um, we'll, we will call them up and we'll do a customer service call and we'll say, mm -hmm. hello, Mr. Curator, how's it going? Yeah. And the response we got was, Nuri, Food's fantastic. 
fish love it. Mm -hmm. And day two rolled around and said, how's it going? Fantastic. By the end of the week, we called and said, Nuri, the fish love the food, but there's a lot of uneaten food at the bottom of the tank. Yeah, we okay, said, fair. okay, how much are you feeding them? Oh, the standard is we take a 250 mil scoop in the morning and in the afternoon, and then we feed them uh, a pound in the evening. Okay, yeah. well, it's a good chunk. how many calories are you feeding them? Mm -hmm. Oh, so we calculated it out, mm -hmm. and they were feeding them. Uh, we, we, we figured out, and they said, hey, you know what? You should actually cut our food down by mm -hmm. about 25%. Hmm. But there was still uneaten food. Why? Because the net calories that the fish needed to eat They're getting full was sooner. far less because mm -hmm. the other diet they were feeding, mm -hmm. the fish also had to remove the inorganics. The other diet was very yeah. high in moisture and mm -hmm. inorganics, right? Yeah. So what happened was they had recently hired a new life support tech. Mm -hmm. And she came to the curator and she said, um, I think there's something wrong with her skimmer. And he said, why is that? She goes, it's just not skimming. And he said, well, did you check the venturi? Yeah, we've got air. Mm -hmm. Did you check the flow? Yeah, th you know, there's a big skimmer yeah. with, you know, commercial schedule, you know, yeah. uh, schedule 80. No, you got to check the flow meter on the pump. Oh, no, no it's going. Mm -hmm. So you've got air and you got water. Mm -hmm. Why isn't the skimmer not working? <laughs> Less crap in the water. <laughs> oh, it's not collecting as much. Yeah. Oh, have you spoke to the lab? Why don't you run some chemical analysis on this? Yeah. So one of the things that I, uh, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, and I'm not mm. in the skimmer business, right? When people compare skimmers and someone says, oh, check out this skimmer versus that skimmer, I want skimmer and water quality analysis. Right. Then we can discuss and then we can compare what we're comparing out. But I'm sorry, you know, a skimmer cup. I've right? never considered that. But yeah, what you're putting in your water is a big difference of what your skimmer is pulling out. And then it's also the amount of how foamy or density and everything mm. else is. Yeah. So I just, I always like to share that story because. That's funny. You, you know, I'm, even I'm not a skimmer that. guy, I'm not a life support professional. Technically you are because you're providing fish food. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But when I, you know, when I heard this story, it's one yeah. I always love to share with, mm -hmm. with hobbyists. And they go, huh. Yep. Never thought of that, right? So mm -hmm. it's really one of those really unique things if it's like, my corals aren't growing. Okay, mm -hmm. what's, what, what's your calcium? What's your magnesium? Yeah. Oh, what about lights? Oh, I, did, I need lights for coral, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like you, you need the full picture no. to talk um, about the whole that, perspective. That's funny, it's something you don't consider. Um, any other types of frozen food in the works besides mysis and cannabis? Not right now. Uh, Got the staples? Wall Street bets, yeah. Okay. So, um, how do you calculate the amount of calories your fish will need in a day? Yeah, so, Percy, I don't know if you were here at the beginning of, uh, of this chat, mm -hmm. but you know, that's really, really, there's so many variables and factors. And so, one of the things you can look right off the bat is what's the flow in your aquarium? So, mm -hmm. as I say in Devon, um, I have a treadmill. Yep. We're going to put Devin on it and we're going to set it to 10 miles an hour. Yep. And then we're going to see how many calories he burned. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bring that down to two miles an hour mm -hmm. and we're going to see how many calories he burns. So if you have a 200 gallon tank and your flow is absolutely tremendous. So you're saying my six foot 200 gallon tank with my MP60s cranked up is a lot of calories my fish are burning? It yeah. could be. It probably is. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's all, you know, th there's so many different variables, you know, depending on, 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 you know, the fish, people, a lot of people, um, most of the kind of white paper scientific studies mm -hmm. are more tailored, <laughs> tiny fish. Fish bits, that's awesome. Um, fish bits. Uh, most of the white papers you see out there are more tailored to kind of calorie requirements for aquaculture which and growing fish, yeah, right? Which is different because they're just trying which, to fatten up fish. Yeah, which is completely different, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, yeah, that's really one of those things of, again, you know, some people will say, depending on species, 4% of their body weight. 6% of their body weight. If they're not eating at all, you're feeding too much. 
uh, cut her yes. back a bit. But yeah, so also good stuff. They won't need as much. Yeah. So yeah, well, that was pretty cool. I appreciate digging into all this today. My pleasure. And I think it's really cool what you guys are doing for the Save Your Aquarium campaign. It's awesome. So if you guys want to help your aquarium, saveyouraquarium.com. Saveyouraquarium.com. Beautiful. Pick yourself up a nice big year supplied pellets. <laughs> Defrosted uh, help minimize faucet. Is rinsing, I, I can't, okay, that's a good one. People ask about that all the time. Personally, I've never bothered rinsing it because I see all those little bits of food is free coral food. So personally, I never bother. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just again, t touching, on, yeah. touching on the phosphates, mm -hmm. um, that, that one again, really, what, what I mentioned earlier is, you know, phosphates or phosphorus is a necessity for animals. So when we look into phosphates going on frozen food or, or, or any type of food, mm -hmm. um, it's what is the amount of digestible food versus inorganics that's mm -hmm. going into the fish? How much are the fish pooping out, so to speak? Makes sense. And then on the other side of it is, you know, in terms of the phosphates going into, you know, from from rinsing food. Mm -hmm. So if you rinse something, you are rinsing away nutrients. Yeah. When you rinse frozen food, you are rinsing away the good stuff. You're probably rinsing away lipids. Yeah. If they're not whole specimens and they're broken apart in the collection process, mm -hmm. you could be rinsing away protein, all those amino acids, amino acids, all that good stuff. whatever you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So rinsing something is going to wash it. It's going to it's going to remove or reduce the amount of everything in there. Yeah, so you are getting rid of them. However, you're also getting rid of the good stuff. You're getting rid of the good stuff, right? So if someone wants to keep phosphates in a minimum, just don't feed your aquarium. <laughs> there you go. That's, that, that's the real key. You don't, if, you, if you don't like phosphates, don't feed your aquarium. But um, the, mm. the, the real thing is you know, looking at um, what is... Good, good phosphates. Good, good phosphates there, and it's also... And and it's yeah. also a matter of, you know, where's the source of that product mm -hmm. and where's it being packed in? Yeah. Is, uh, are they watering it down? Mm -hmm. Are they not? You know, um, one of the things I always, always like to mention is, uh, you know, so here at Piscine, you know, we... If you haven't seen our videos, you know, our, our, our mysis are dewatered coming up and, mm -hmm. you know, it goes into the package, you know. Yep. Um, there's still uh, uh, moisture in there, right? Yeah. package I mean, is going to have, you know, 70% moisture, yep. whatever it is. Um, but, you know, you look at some of these other products, mm -hmm. they can have upwards of 90 to 95% moisture. Yeah, tons. So what that means is where's that water coming from. Mm -hmm. Is it a clean glacial fed lake? Yeah. Is it a pond in the middle of summer? Of yeah. summer? So yeah, that makes sense. a good chunk of it is what is that water coming from? Where's that water coming from? Where are the phosphates? What is what? PE is for water content? Uh -huh. Well, majority, <laughs> majority of the water, like our, our flat pack, it's basically, you know, the shrimp being uh, yeah. uh, coming off on the conveyor belt, right? Yeah. So it's actually no, it's actually uh, kind of cool to see Lake that. water. Yeah. <laughs> right, getting lake water. Perfect. Oh, no natural. Uh, yeah. Locally. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. And um, so that's kind of, it's, it's mm -hmm. those, those phosphates, and we know everyone's trying to control algae and, and, and everything else in the reef tank, um, but it's really, um, there's a lot of great articles out there, mm -hmm. uh, some, some better than others. But I always like to say, uh, I always encourage everyone to begin their research on phosphate with yeah. why do we need phosphates as opposed to how do I get rid of it? Let's learn about why we need it. I've never bought the rinsing, never had an issue. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can tell you, First most thing. of our customers, um, I should say, yeah, like most of our, our institutional customers mm -hmm. don't rinse. Okay. So they just open a flat pack. Yeah, so we're just throwing in, in, in packs. That, that's how I like to feed. Yeah. I like to just, you know, thaw it out, break off a square of thaw it out, at, right into the tank, frozen. Oh, you know, yeah. um, it's really if, I, I know some of the seahorse hobbyists, mm -hmm. you know, if they're just keeping seahorses in and not in a reef tank, mm -hmm. some of them may rinse it. Okay. 
just because yeah. they're, they're pouring it in constantly. If they have a reef tank, you're pouring it right yeah. in. If you have a reef tank, all those amino acids are going to feed your corals. Yeah. And all those little tiny particles, like the little bits in there, that's to me, that's all coral food. It's stuff really easy for the corals to catch and eat. So. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's um, why I don't bother. It, it, it's really just one of those things. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, again, we're in this hobby. It's not a right or wrong answer. Yeah, you know? so everyone has their own, uh, their own perspective and, mm -hmm. and what they do. Um, just more for aesthetics, you know, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of, say, people with freshwater tanks who don't necessarily have, um, like, overflow boxes. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, just if they're having live plants, they don't want kind of that film on the surface. Mm -hmm. Just, and, and, our, and on the freshwater side of things, our product is extremely popular, say, discus hobbyists. Mm -hmm. Discus hobbyists kind of go hand in hand with planted mm -hmm. tanks, yeah. right? So I would say if people are rinsing it's probably more on the freshwater side that okay. are rinsing than salt water but it's really more for aesthetics and okay. more for husbandry so they're not getting that film and they're getting good light penetration down in their planted tanks yeah okay fair enough good to know never considered the freshwater side of it there you guys go pick up well tanks. we better start plant dude or something yeah plant <laughs> dudes there you go perfect all right guys i think we covered most things today so hopefully you guys enjoyed it if you did as always hit that like button if you want to help save your aquarium Pick yourself up a nice bucket of pellets and give one to your favorite aquarium as well. So that's pretty cool. Love that. Fun times, Evan. Yep. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed it, as always. And I'll see you guys next week. Take care.